Good afternoon to my Wednesday at Winners. Welcome back and thanks for coming back after my little break last Wednesday when I was uh, watching Zoom, a Zoom meeting for, for all day long as we gathered, the pastors in the area gathered for our annual theological conference, which usually happens at Lake of the Ozarks, and uh, we sort of missed that part this year. Um, but we did get two excellent presenters and had some good conversation, and uh, a good time was had by all, and continuing ed was accomplished. So uh, it was a good time. Thank you for um, letting me take that day off and get going on some other things. So um, good to see you today. Today we are going to start on Genesis 31. So if you want to go get your Bible and uh, a marker give you a little minute to find yourself on Genesis 31. As you can tell, I'm home. So my, my uh, space in front of me, in front of the camera, is a little bit smaller than I have at church. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you have to do a little book shuffling here, but uh, I think we can get along. So, we've been, uh, we've been rolling along in the story of, predominantly at this point, Jacob, um, whose father was Isaac, right? Whose father was I hear you, Abraham. Good, good going. So Abraham, who had Isaac and Ishmael, and then Isaac had Jacob and Esau, his brother. So now we're talking about Jacob. Um, and he had been sent back by his uh, mom and dad to the homeland to find himself a wife. And let me just um, kind of review the Jacob story. Um, it's been a while since we did the last part of it, so let me just hit the high points so that you kind of get yourself back into Jacob's life and his story. And speaking of Jacob, let me just ask for some prayers, please. Um, our youth director, Megan's husband, Jacob, and she were both exposed to the virus last weekend. Uh, Megan has tested negative, but unfortunately, Jacob tested positive and he is starting to experience symptoms. So please hold them in your prayers, especially Jacob as he fights through uh, whatever the virus is going to do in his body. We hope that it does not get a big hold on him. Uh, and also on Megan that she stays safe. So they are both quarantined for uh, 10 to 12 days now. So we won't see um, Megan at church or any place else for that matter for the next couple of days. But please hold them in your prayers. I would appreciate that. So that other Jacob that we're talking about in Genesis, um, these are some of the high points of his story that we've talked about thus far. First of all, we remember him because he was the one who sells his imprudent brother Esau the soup at, for the price of his birthright, you know, which is kind of an uneven transaction, but Jacob being very crafty and um, shrewd and his mother Rebecca, who had a hand in all of this, um, helped that along. Then Jacob deceives his father. Uh, so that he gets to steal his brother's blessing. And we talked about the difference between birthright and blessing. Uh, the birthright is a, basically the rights of the firstborn to receive property and that sort of thing. The blessing comes to whomever the father wants to bestow it upon. And he obviously would normally just bestow that also on Esau, the firstborn. But he was deceived through Rebecca and Jacob's trickery and it was given the blessing that obviously cannot be taken back. So then Jacob goes um, back to the homeland where his mother's brother Laban receives him. This is where he is hoping to find himself a bride. And um, he meets Rachel at the well and immediately, I'm sorry, not, yes, Rachel, I said Rebecca before and I meant Rachel. Um, Rachel at the well falls immediately in love with her. And then unfortunately, Laban is the one now who starts the deceiving. And he marries, uh, first of all, he makes a deal with Jacob to have him work for, for him for seven years for the hand of Rachel. And on the wedding night, he switches the daughters and Jacob gets Leah. 
So then Laban uh, kind of really coerces Jacob into staying with him for additional service so that he can now get the earn and earn enough so that he can purchase Rachel as his wife. Laban takes the flocks that he promised um, as payment to Jacob. And then Jacob returns the manipulation uh, of his, of Laban's flocks uh, to produce offspring that are not as um, healthy and are not as um, profitable as the ones that, um, that the other ones that he doesn't have that many of. So Jacob is able to purchase from Laban the, the lesser animals um, at a great price. So his flocks get bigger and bigger. And then Jacob secretly flees from Laban with everything that he has acquired as he's been working there for lo these many years, a couple of decades. <clears throat> and so that's about where we pick up today. Um, so that's kind of the Cliff's Notes of, uh, of the Jacob cycle and um, his father-in-law Laban and how they have continued to um, connect to one another over these two women, the daughters of Laban, and that would be Rachel and Leah. So we're picking it up at chapter 31. Hope you're all found the place and are ready to hear the story. So here, welcome to adult story time. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's. He has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him as favorably as he did before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your ancestors and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was. And he said to them, I see that your father does not regard me as favorably as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, Yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, The speckled shall be your wages, then all the flock bore speckled. And if he said, The striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. During the mating of the flock, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw the male goats that leaped upon the flock were striped, speckled, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Look up and see that all the goats that leap on the flock are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now, leave this land at once and return to the land of your birth. Then Rachel and Leah answered him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has been using up the money given for us. All the property that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. So Jacob arose and, said his, and set his children and his wives on camels, and he drove away all his livestock, all the property that he had gained, the livestock in his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. Starting out, he crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his kinsfolk with him and pursued him for seven days until he caught up with him at the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, Take heed 
that you say not a word to Jacob, either good or bad. Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pinched, pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsfolk camped in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You have deceived me and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre. And why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? What you have done is foolish. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Take heed that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. Even though you had to go because you longed greatly for your father's house, why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. But anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsfolk, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maids, but he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about in the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but he did not find the household gods. Then Jacob became angry and upbraided Laban. Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Although you have felt about through all my goods, what have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsfolk and your kinsfolk, so that they may decide between us two. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. That which was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you, I bore the loss of it myself. Of my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. It was like this with me. By day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sheep fled from my sleep fled from wait a minute. <laughs> by day <laughs> and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do today about these daughters of mine, or about their children whom they have borne? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsfolk, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Shahadutha, but Jacob called it Galiid. Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore he called it Galiid, and the pillar Mitzpah. For he said, The Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from the other. If you ill treat my daughters, or if you take wives in addition to my daughters, though no one else is with us, remember that God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap? 
and see this pillar which I have set between you and me? This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar for harm. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father, Isaac, and Jacob offered a sacrifice on the height and called his kinsfolk to eat bread, and they ate bread and tarried all night in the hill country. Early in the morning, Laban rose up and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he departed and returned home. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. So he called that place Mahanaim. Okay, the twists and the turns, it's all so exciting. <laughs> Melissa says, all these people seem horrible. Are we supposed to admire them? I don't think we're supposed to do anything except just hear their story and make our own judgments. However, we do have to always remember that these stories, um, really the purpose of them is not, and the purpose of most stories in the scripture are not for us to look at these people as models of the godly life. You know, there are some, but mostly this is a story of humanity and how human beings just continue um, to misbehave. You know, even when God is involved, we cannot turn that human spirit of um, self-centeredness and greed and all those things that we do that we keep choosing uh, over God, and yet God continues to come, and God con continues to draw them forward into uh, the future that is being made new with God. So I think what um, one of the things that I think is interesting in all of these stories here in these cycles, the Abraham and Isaac and Jacob cycle, is that no matter what the intention was, it is God's will that is that is being that is coming out. Okay, you know, so it's God, it's God's plan and it's God's will. And it's not that they're, that God has a plan and he's forcing people to do it. I think the idea here is that God has an overarching intention. And um, in that intention, we get an idea of who God is and how much God loves us. Let me read to you. In fact, thanks for that question because I wanted to share this with you. Anyway, some of you have heard me speak of uh, Walter Brueggemann, who is like the preeminent um, Old Testament scholar. And uh, I've been privileged to hear him speak in person a number of times. And he is just an amazingly um, prolific author. And just as, as I say, he's, he's the guy. When you want to talk about Old Testament, Brueggemann is the guy. But here's... Here's something I wanted to share with you. It is the earthly man through whom the resilient purposes of God are being worked out. The purpose of God is somehow operative, even in the places of scandal and deception. Precisely in this doubtful character, the promise of God is being fulfilled. In the midst of the ambiguities, the promise is having its way. So there you have it. I mean, as, as, as we can see, you know, God has a plan. God had a plan for Adam and Eve that they would live with him in the garden. They would be good companions and they would live out their life. And Adam and Eve chose differently. You know, God had a plan for Abraham. God had a plan for Sarah. And they were to, you know, they just couldn't wait for God's plan to take effect. So they took matters into their own hands and complicated it. Uh, completely. And yet, the plan, the promise, how does he put it, the resilient purpose of God is really not uh, stymied by the rocks that we throw in the path or in the way we try to change the narrative. God still um, is going to draw things out regardless of what we give him, you know, regardless the pieces of the story that we give God the narrative that God wants to unfold will unfold. And I don't mean in any way, shape, or form that God is restricting us. We still have complete freedom of the will. 
And when we choose, apart from what God's will is or God's intention is, God can just shift and bring forth the intention out of what we've given him. So I, I love that piece by Brueggemann that talks about, you know, no matter what we do, God's plan is going to win. It's not that God has a plan that on Tuesday you're going to wear green and you're going to run into the person you're going to love for the rest of your life. That's not what we mean when we say God has a plan for your life. God has a resilient intention. I like that phrase, a resilient intention. Um, and and no matter what we do, no matter how we choose, let's put it that way, um, it, that's going to, to trump everything, really. That's going to be the thing that continues through the narrative and draws it towards uh, the conclusion that God has in mind when God started out. Um, that's why I always kid about the book of Revelation, which everybody likes to look at as if it's a description of the end times. And the only thing, and I, and I don't do study on that because it really is not, um, it's not something that we can be edified by because we keep overlaying it with all kinds of other stuff that has come up since it was written. So I say the only thing you need to know about the book of Revelation is that God wins. You know, and that's it. You know, the only thing you really need to know about scripture is that God's resilient intentions will probably will at the end be what um, prevails. So um, that's the hope. I mean, that's the good news that even when we see no way out, even when we see nothing but darkness, God's got a, an intention to to make the lightness shine, to make uh, the whole world new to make death turn into resurrection. So, um, so thank you for that question. And thank you for allowing me to pontificate on that for a few moments. Um, so anyway, as we go back here to the story of Laban, I mean, first we saw, we've just seen deception and people tricking each other and trying to force the issue and trying to make things work the way they want them to work. Um, all the while, it's interesting to me because all the while they are listening, they are listening to God. You know, God said, go to your mother's brother's household to find yourself a wife. So he did, you know, God told Abraham and Sarah, you know, leave this place and go to the place that I'll show you. And they did, but they also disobeyed um, what was clearly the purpose that God had in mind for them or the promise that God had given and tried to take it into their own hands to speed it up or to change it or to do something um, that then God had to sidestep or respond to to make sure that the intention was was holding. So um, the interesting thing here, uh, one other interesting thing I wanted to say about just the depiction here, we usually focus on Rachel and Leah. Uh, Rachel was the pretty one. She's the one that Jacob fell in love with. Leah was like the less desirable one. She was older. She hadn't found anybody to uh, to marry her yet. And so you always kind of think of poor Leah. You know, she's she's just not, you know, the 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 piece that that Jacob wanted, you know. And so so anyway, we see these two um, siblings at, at odds with one another. And uh, and that's kind of where, where we go when we talk about those two women. But I think the picture here is. Um, is really kind of modern in the fact that we have that they are they're rowdy, um, they scheme either separately or together. They are basically saying to Jacob, you know, everything that you've stolen from our father, you've stolen from us. Um, and you're kind of like, <laughs> you know, this is not the way wives usually talk to their husbands in this time, you know. So, uh, so they were they were risking some stuff here you know, as they are now going to be leaving their father and their kinsmen to go with Jacob to his father and his kinsmen. So they get their, they get their licks in there, which I think is kind of cool. And the fact that Rachel <laughs> steals from her own father, the, the household gods, which were um, little figurines that oftentimes were, could have been um, images of fertility gods or, you know, in the pagan world where people had all different kinds of gods. There might have been a fertility god. There might have been a harvest god, uh, you know, a creation god so that the planting went well. So all these little figurines that they would have on an altar 
that would be the household gods. And they also had, um, at that time, they may have had a, um, also figurines that weren't necessarily gods, but they were sort of the, um, when I pass this little figurine on to my firstborn son, uh, the birthright goes with it, the blessing goes with it, and everyone would recognize that now since this person holds this figurine, which has whatever significance, uh, that they are the one who is in authority over this clan or this tribe or whatever. So those the household gods were important. Not, I mean, they were made of precious metals, and that in itself was, was cool, but the fact that she took the household gods is like, I'm leaving you godless, you know, you're going to have to, and maybe since they, since Laban has had this uh, experience of God coming to him in the night and speaking to him, um, we don't know, but, but, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about what might have happened to Laban and his, his faith after he sends his two daughters and his, a lot, good portion of his flock along with Jacob to go back to um, the God of Israel. So, um, any other comments, questions on that section? Okay, so uh, the other thing I did want to call your attention to is um, when the girls um, are kind of crabbing about their situation. Uh, then Rachel and Leah answered him, is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? In other words, why would we stay there? There's no reason to stay there. Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and he has been using up the money given for us. All the property that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. So basically, it's almost as if, um, you know, they are following their possessions even to the point of leaving their faith and their family to go with Jacob and his God because now the possessions are in the, the property or in the household of Jacob and his God. Uh, so there's, there's a, little bit of, a little bit of tweaking there of, of these ladies who are, you know, kind of saying, we're not, we're not doing this out of love, <laughs> you know, um, that came earlier, but now they're, they're making the best deal that they can make. So and that's just that, de de the depiction of the women in that position. Um, we always say, you know, women are property and so on and so forth. Well, they are, but they also sometimes can just, you know, put, put their foot down and say, this is how it's going to be. And we, we're going to see some more of that throughout this story. So I'm going to pick it up now at 32. Up, oh, What is meant by the fear of Isaac? Oh, I meant to look, look at that. Um, some scholars suggest kinsmen of Isaac. Isaac's ordeal in chapter 22 naturally comes to mind. So the, um, you know, the whole idea that he was almost sacrificed by his own father um, so when they're talking about the fear of Isaac, like, you know, the worst fear, the fear of death, basically. So when they're talking about that, but, you know, he does this because of the fear of Isaac, um, it, it literally means that, you know, the fact is that Isaac faced death and made it through. So they're, they fear, you know, it's a, it's a great fear and, you know, they're going to make it through as well. So, so Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. So this is like the most pure emotion that human beings probably have is the fear of dying. So it's a it's a pretty strong uh, 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 you know, a pretty strong vow that he has made. Uh, did you hear the two booms in Olathe today? Well, I heard what I thought was uh, thunder, but I didn't hear booms. Any, anybody else know anything about the booms? in Olathe today? Not I. Anyway, Gloria, if you welcome, and if you uh, if you get any, any info on the booms, let us know what's going on. Okay, so at chapter 32, I'm going to pick up reading again, and feel free to question. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So apparently he recognized them as messengers of God. So he called that place Mahanaim, which means the, the place of God's camp. 
Jacob sent messengers before him to, oh, sorry. Um, oh, I lost my place. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau. Okay, now remember, this is Esau, the brother who, um, you know, they, they are not, they were not on good terms when last they spoke or saw each other. So this is years have passed now, 20 years have passed and Jacob is going home and he knows when he gets home, he's going to have to encounter his brother Esau. Jacob sends messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob. I have lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now, and I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. So he's given him fair warning that he's coming. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Uh-oh. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies, thinking, if Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed the Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. So he spent that night there, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he delivered into the hand of his servants every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the foremost, when Esau my brother meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau, and moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves, you shall say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself spent that night in the camp. Okay, I want to stop there for just one minute. Um, interesting now, he has come from the land of Laban, where he has learned um, about negotiating and um, the value of the flocks and that sort of thing. And he also is uh, really, truly, I think, afraid of the fact that Esau has every right to come and just obliterate him and his family and his wealth, because uh, that's pretty much what he took away from Esau. So it would certainly be uh, understandable if Esau were to come after him at this point. So all of this is uh, preparation for trying to impress Esau with, you know, that he's done really well and now he's coming back and he is sharing this with his brother as a present. And once he opens the present and he'll feel, you know, so much more loving towards his brother who has given him this gift, um, then he can meet his brother face to face. 
and uh, and hopefully then it will be okay because he's given him this this great gift of all this stuff. Um, I love the fact if you look back through the through the gift and you know I was just reading through it, but notice two hundred female goats and twenty male goats. So you got you know just enough male goats to keep the female goats impregnated and not be too much of a problem. Two hundred ewes and twenty rams. 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls. So in other words, what he's giving is uh, far and away more of the female of the genders here, or of the, of the flocks here, um, to make sure that there will be a proliferation of the flock. You know, so he's giving him, uh, you know, just enough of the male to keep the females impregnated and making, you know, offspring, which will increase the flock and increase the value. So he, you know, he sends the messenger with all of these, you know, flock after flock after flock, and now he's going to spend the night by himself, uh, waiting to get the message, and uh, and and approach his brother Esau. So here we have this little sidebar passage, of, um, and this is a pretty, you know, you know this story pretty well. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God's face, God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Okay. We've heard this story hundreds of times, um, the wrestling with God, you know, the night before he's going to go and, and re-encounter his brother Esau, and he is expecting for certain that this is not going to go well. Um, I've been reading some newer commentaries, and one of the ones that I do is, is much informed um, by the Hebrew scriptures and by the Hebrew, well, I mean, this is the Hebrew scriptures, but by Hebrew interpretation of these uh, scriptures and then um, talking with someone who actually uh, sees how these then are reflected and echoed into the New Testament. So some, one of the things that someone suggests, and again, these are what think, you know, scholars posit, you know, what about this? How about, let's think about it like this, you know, and always giving you different ideas on how to view something that you think you've got all figured out. And it, you know, they put the spoon in the bowl and start stirring and then you, then you can't ever read it again the same way. So I'm going to mess you up a little bit here. Um, the suggestion is that this is not God in human form with whom he is wrestling, but this is um, Esau himself. That Esau has snuck into his camp and is, you know, like two brothers, you know, jumping on him and wrestling around and, you know, all this kind of stuff in the dark. So let me read this passage again. And just imagine what it is instead of instead of imagining God in human form who's come, you know, as a kind of the incarnation of his conscience, like what's going to happen here. I'm, you know, I'm wrestling with myself because I want to keep my family safe, but I want to go back because God told me to. I want to keep my, you know, feet, my flocks intact. I want to I want to go home. But Esau's there and he's really mad at me and he has every right to be mad at me. You know, so he's having this argument with himself, which could very well have been personified as God as the conscience, okay? But think about this if this truly were Esau. Um, Jacob was left alone, 
and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. I mean, anybody can do that. And, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then, Jacob, then, then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. He doesn't want to be discovered for who he really is. But Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man, oh, I have a footnote. Then he said, the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans. That's what, that's what Israel means, uh, Israel, so struggling, striven with God um, and with humans and have prevailed. So it's like, yes, you've, all, you've, you've struggled with your conscience. You struggled with God and God's promises and God's, um, even the stuff that God has said to you, like, go home and I'll make it good for you. Um, and then he also adds on, I'm going to, you know, make your generations like the stars in the sand, which is the promise of Abraham to Abraham. So this, this person, whoever this man is, says, um, you have striven with God and with humans like Laban and Esau, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, which was nobody had seen God face to face and, and lived, um, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. And then the idea that they don't eat the, the particular um, muscle that hits onto the hip socket because that reminds them of Jacob being, um, being hit in the hip socket and having it come out of joint in this wrestling. So I thought there is, that is an interesting, I think, a very interesting turn if you're going to look at this and say, okay, what if Esau came to meet him, any, you know, just under cover of darkness, uh, maybe wanted to talk with him, maybe just wanted to beat the snot out of him, you know, we're not really sure. We don't know how Esau is going to receive him. Um, so we have this interesting little time, like, two, I mean, can you see two little boys just wrestling around in the grass for no apparent reason? So here we have two brothers with a reason to be arguing and to be fighting and striving with one another um, all through the night. Uh, and just, you know, it's like in the movies, you know, where they beat each other to a pulp and then, you know, they gather their strength up again and they run at each other again and they do it again. I mean, it's just the pictures of this, I think, are so, um, so illustrative of how human children um, encounter one another. So not to say that this wasn't a God a God striving, um, that this wasn't a vision or a dream or, um, you know, or, or God literally coming to, you know, knock some sense into Jacob. But I just like that other, that other possibility of it being actually Esau, especially as we come now into, uh, the encounter between the two of them. So any questions there? Okay. Chapter 33. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids, and he put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Just a quick insert there. Rachel, you know, mother of Joseph, who's going to be the one who becomes the Pharaoh's right-hand man, because he reads dreams, and one of the dreams isn't it that there are, you know, um, bowing to the ground, the sheaves of wheat bowing to the other thing. So we have, even in Joseph's dreams, um, kind of echoes of his own personal past as he watched his father, um, you know, bow down in front of his brother 
And then that's going to happen in his life as well, only it's going to come to him as a dream and then help him forward. So I just thought that was kind of a cool little uh, piece of echo that you can carry forward with you. Um, so he's bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Pregnant pause. What's going to happen? Is he going to run at him and knife him in the gut? Is he going to kick him? Is he going to grab him and carry him away? What's going to happen? But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. I like that. When Esau looked up and saw the women and the children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given to your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah, likewise, and her children drew near and bowed down. And finally, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please, if I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly, to see your face is like seeing the face of God, since you have received me with such favor. Please accept my gift that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have everything I want. So he urged him, and Esau took it. Then Esau said, let us journey on our way and I will go alongside you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me. And if they are overdriven for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant and I will lead on slowly according to the pace of the cattle that are before me and according to the pace of their children, of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, why should my Lord be so kind to me? So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the place is called Succoth. Um, Sukkoth means booths, and that's um, the, the Hebrew um, festival later on that will be the festival of booths. Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for 100 pieces of money the plot of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Now, just note, I'm sure most of you don't have the old ancient Palestinian and all that Middle Eastern area completely stuck in your head. Uh, I think you probably have the Tigris and Euphrates, and I think you probably have Israel and Jerusalem and some of those places. But when he Jacob is supposed to follow Esau to Seir, which is where he had, had sent off to. Okay, but he tells Esau to go ahead because he wants to not go too quickly for the children into the nursing um, part of the flock. So as soon as Esau leaves, apparently with the gift that, that Jacob has given him, Jacob can move a little more quickly. So Esau goes one way to the north and Jacob journeys to Succoth, which is the opposite direction. And he goes to um, Shechem which is in Canaan, which is where he was headed. So even though he has this amazing and merciful encounter with his brother, and I love to use this whenever anybody wants to talk about reconciliation. Uh, and you may actually, you may hear me pull this out. Um, you know, after our uh, presidential election, uh, I think there's going to be a great need for reconciliation on both sides. So this could very well be um, a story that you will hear again in the not-too-distant future where you have two brothers who've been estranged, 
there's a lot of emotion and a lot of resentment and a lot of reason for those things to be present. And yet one steps up and is merciful. And then the reconciliation can happen. And then they can go on their way and live their lives. Um, it doesn't mean they have to go off together arm in arm. You know, they both have lives. They both have families and flocks to tend to. Uh, but that reconciliation needed to happen before Jacob could come back to Canaan. And, and I also wanted to mention, uh, when he is renamed from Jacob to Israel by God or Esau, <laughs> however that happens, um, that is the first mention of the word Israel in, in the Old Testament. So in 32, chapter 32, we have the renaming to become Israel. So that's the first time. And now we're going to start seeing that much more often um, because that is, um, that is the name that he will carry forward now. And that will become the name that identifies the whole people of Israel. So um, El, so he erects an altar and calls it El Elohe Israel. So El, obviously, E-L is the name of God. And so this is God, the God of Israel. Okay, so that's the name of the place. So that's what I'm going to do today. i just finish up just a tiny bit early because the next section um, is, a, again, sort of a change of scene and a change of, uh, of folks. Uh, some passage of time and everything. So we will start um, with chapter 20, 34, sorry, um, next week, which is the 28th. Okay. So I hope that uh, you learned some things you didn't know so far. Um, even though this is really just, I, you really hardly need any interpretation because this story is so rich and, um, and there's just so much that is exactly the way people are. Right? It's just kind of the human story. And as um, uh, Melissa asked, you know, do, are, we supposed to, are we supposed to be models or admire these people because they're such great people? And it's like, no, we're supposed to relate to these people because they're just like us. Uh, you know, a, a little older, but uh, we haven't gotten much wiser in the centuries that have intervened. So, so I hope you have a great day. Um, I'm going to check one more time, see if there's any questions here. If anybody finds out what the two booms in Olathe were, let me know. <laughs> I'm coming over there tonight for confirmation. So, so anyway, I'll see you. Um, see you on Sunday. Reformation confirmation. Please wear red wherever you are. Um, you can wear your you can wear your chief's jammies if you want to on the couch and have a cup of coffee and watch our confirmands go through the rite of confirmation uh, on Sunday at the 10 a.m. live stream. Hope to see you then, and if not then, I'll see you next week, same time, same station, and I'll be back in my office at church with a little more room. <laughs> so have a great day. Bye bye.